I remember when I were a lad, and our mum used to send me down to the beach to muck out donkeys. Hey, it were grand. Oh, I'm not sure I can keep that sort of thing going without inciting violence among people of good taste. So let me just say that the North is an extraordinarily rich place to find the traditional English seaside experience. Oh dear, that's just about as bad. I'm beginning to sound like a tourist art this time. Seaside experience. <gasps> just ignore me and have a look at these pictures. Yorkshire coast, which is described in many tourist brochures and things as Yorkshire's heritage coast. What do people mean when they say that? What do they mean by seaside heritage? Well, I think they mean two things. First of all, they mean that it looks old and traditional in the sense that it started life as a fishing village. If you want to be part of seaside heritage, you need cobbled streets, preferably steep ones, which should be lined with cottages, not houses. I've noticed that in brochures and websites that seaside heritage places never have any houses. They're always cottages. If at all possible, the cottages should be brightly painted, which not only looks nice, but is intensely practical as well. For hundreds of years, rendering and painting the external walls of cottages has offered extra protection from the unfriendly elements to be found on these North Sea coasts. So this is all totally traditional. So is this. All roofs should be steep, and on the East Coast, which is where we are now, they should be covered with bright orange pantiles. There should be little lanes, needless to say, sneaking off between the houses. Steep ones, with many a staircase, down which it's obvious to all that smugglers plied their sneaky trade in days gone by. You definitely want a few lobster pots strewn around and general bits of detritus belonging to the fishing industry. That adds immensely to the heritage atmosphere. And of course the street must lead straight down to a pretty harbour with a breakwater made doubly picturesque by colourful fishing boats bobbing around. I sound as if I've taken the mickey out of it, but I'm not really. Well, not at all. I might be taking the mickey a bit out about the way the tourist ads talk about such places, but I'm a sucker for them, really. We all are. Our, our cameraman, town boy, George, you know the man has had to be nailed down to stop him whipping off and taking pictures of boats. But you know, he's a sucker for it too, because it is really pretty irresistible. And we're lucky enough here in the north, especially on the North Yorkshire coast, to be awash with such places. I'm here in Staithes at the moment, but there are scenes like this all up and down this coast. But to be dubbed a heritage coast, I don't think it's enough to look like a haunt of 18th century smugglers. You need something else as well. You need ice creams. You need to be dabbling your toes into the waters of the traditional English seaside resort. Amazingly tough and resilient culture and identity are. And here we are, 
half a century into the era of cheap foreign travel, with most of the population zooming off yearly to exotic places, and yet at home, your English seaside resort still looks much as it always has. And we're lucky enough, we in the north are lucky enough, to have two of the greatest resorts of all. In Blackpool, where we're going in a moment, we have the ultimate example. And here at Scarborough, we have the place where seaside tourism all began. Now, it's not often I'm brave enough to say something as bold as that, but I think it's true. There were mineral springs discovered on the beach along here in 1635, and people started to come to take the waters. And by the end of the 17th century, the, uh, the owner of the spa, Dr Whitty, he was selling seawater as well and encouraging people to go bathing. I've, I've told this story on television before. Actually, I've stood on this very spot and in an earlier programme and taken off all of my clothes, except for a flesh-coloured and deeply uncomfortable thong, and then ran into the sea in order to demonstrate not only my imperviousness to shame, but also the fact that for the first hundred years or so, the bathing was done in the nude. So, Scarborough was the first bathing resort. First of all, as an elegant Regency and early Victorian resort for the gently nurtured. But then, later in the 19th century, after the arrival of the railway, Scarborough grew into something a touch bigger and a touch, how shall I put it, noisier, with the arrival of mass tourism and the giant hotels that were needed to service it. In the Grand Hotel, it's got one of the granddaddies of all Victorian seaside hotels. It is gigantic, 13 storeys high, with an extraordinary roof. It's got about 40,000 bedrooms and it entirely dominates the town in the most splendid way. All around it grew that wonderful frothy mix that we've come to expect of the seaside. The architecture of fun, tea shops and cafes, which at first were polite and restrained, but which as the years went by got brighter and noisier and more exciting. So today, Scarborough is a wonderful combination of the rather refined and the rather brash. But if you think it's okay to call Scarborough brash, what words are you going to use about Blackpool? Blackpool is quite different from Scarborough. Its history is quite different. In the middle of the 19th century, it was still a village with about 3.4 people in it and a donkey. It just happened to be a village parked beside seven miles of pristine sand, a few miles from the densely packed and rich towns of the Lancashire cotton industry. Those sands were clearly going to be a draw, and they soon were. The railway arrived in 1845. The first pier was built in 1863. Within a very few years, there were three splendid piers stretched out enticingly across the sands and packed with entertainment. Soon afterwards, there were about a zillion visitors, and there are still said to be about seven million, come each year, and of course, they all need to be entertained. I first came to Blackpool when I was a teenager and I was persuaded, against my better judgement, because I've never been a brave person, to have a go on one of these. Actually, because it was quite a long time ago, it wasn't as tall as this one, nor indeed as fast. In fact, it was about three feet tall and rather slow, but nevertheless, I threw up when I got off. And so today, I offered the choice between a go on the big one with all the possibilities that offers of marvellous television shots or a quiet stroll along the Golden Mile towards the tower, which should I choose, eh? Oh, 
Definitely loud and brash. But then nobody's ever accused Blackpool of being subtle and refined. Oh, that's what the seaside's really supposed to be like. Oh. Tower, Blackpool's most famous building, which was built in the 1890s at a cost of £45,000, which seems like an awful bargain to me. It costs about that much to have your car serviced nowadays. This is pretty obviously modelled on the Eiffel Tower, which had been built a couple of years earlier, though it's much smaller than the Paris version, about half the size in fact, 500 feet to Paris's 984, and it's a bit fancier on top. It's got twiddly bits in place of Paris's elegant simplicity. And to be honest, there are those who compare Blackpool's tower unfavourably with Le Tour Eiffel in terms of elegance. But such critics have clearly not been inside. <laughs> This is the Tower Ballroom, which is one of a number of quite extraordinary late Victorian and Edwardian rooms in Blackpool. It was designed in 1899 by Frank Matcham, who was the most famous theatre designer of that period. It has the biggest sprung dance floor in the world. It's a pity that I can't dance, though when has inadequacy ever stopped me? It has a Wurlitzer theatre organ, which, well, you can see what it does. But of course, it's more than just a dance floor and a stage. This is a room of quite fabulous richness. It oozes plaster work. It's awash with fancy bits. It's like being in a Viennese palace or some Baroque Central European opera house. Except it's not. It's in Blackpool, built for ordinary northern people. It may be one of the richest and most elaborate rooms in Britain, but it's not a royal palace, but a people's palace. Just up the road from Blackpool, you come to Lytham St Anne's. Or Lytham and St Anne's on Sea, which is sort of like the quiet and tasteful end of Blackpool. St Anne's is still a very sandy place, with a real sense of the seaside about it, but it's also a really interesting place. It was a new town laid out in 1875 by a company called the St Anne's by the Sea Land and Building Company. Snappy little title. Their architects had an interesting name too. They were called Maxwell and Took. Sounds like a, a firm of shady lawyers, but they went on to design the Blackpool Tower later. But the town that they laid out was a sort of complete middle-class suburb by the sea. Lots of the houses were specially designed to deal with local circumstances. Strong, cobbly garden walls to look suitably seasidey and to keep the drifting sand at bay. And balconies of all sorts and sizes to take advantage of the view. They provided nice, comfortable communal activities as well, such as you might find in any such suburb. Parks and boating lakes, tennis clubs and bowls clubs. And churches followed. None more extraordinary than the White Church built in 1907, just off the seafront. 
This is the Byzantine style, built in white tiles. I'd like to say that only Lancashire would have the guts to get away with something like that, but it's typical of the sort of adventure that you find in the buildings all around here. I really love it. It's wacky, but it really fits in. This is classic suburbia, but it's suburbia by the seaside. And so they built themselves a pier as well, not to be outdone by Blackpool, I presume. This is one of my favourite piers, actually. It was built in the 1880s, but the front was added a bit later. What a perfect summary of English seaside style. Cosy Edwardian black and white architecture with gabled roofs and clocks and lots of nice sticky uppy bits, all very typical of about 1900. But stuck on the front, this stuff was added in the 1950s with fabulous 1950s lettering. I just love that style. And then the pier itself. Entertainment piers like this originated, well, they were copied from the jetties that were built for ships to tie up to. In quite a lot of the early resorts, built before the arrival of the railways, visitors would arrive by paddle steamer, but they very soon lost that function and became purely and simply places of entertainment. The first ones were open to the elements and just made for a nice little stroll upon the waters. The first one of all was built in Brighton in 1823, but this one, as I say, was designed, well, I think it was designed, I'm not absolutely sure of this, by the sort of main man as far as Victorian peers is concerned. I hope it was by him because he's got a fantastic name. He was called Eugenius Birch. The problem is that it was only opened in 1885, but that he died in 1884, so I think that he designed it and somebody else finished it off. Eugenius was an engineer who'd worked on big things like railways, but he went on to specialise in piers. And he invented new ways to make them safer. These iron piles, for example, had screws on the end so that instead of just hammering them down into the sand, they were screwed deep down to make them even more stable. That was his invention. He'd also spent time in India working on the Indian railways, and so he was the first person to introduce these little touches of oriental glamour to piers as well. A bit of foreign romance to spice up your stroll through the ozone. What could be nicer? It's so nice down here, so genteel and civilised, you can really understand what persuaded our Victorian ancestors to come down and live beside the seaside. Long before St Anne's was begun in the 1870s, there was already a little town just along the coast, which is called Lytham. It had already existed for at least a thousand years. This is it today. It's a lovely place, full of nice shops and cafes and pretty ladies. I tend to notice these things because I'm very observant. But what I can't observe is the sea. Not from here, from the town itself. It's just a couple of hundred yards down there. And yet for most of its history, the town just completely ignored it, turned its back on it. In fact, just up here, in the opposite direction from the sea, just beyond the station, is a house which I showed in a previous programme, Lytham Hall. Lytham Hall was built in the 1750s when there was a real passion for nature. All over the country people were building their houses with landscape grounds in places which took advantage of the best possible views. And yet the interesting thing here is that they chose to ignore the sea. It's less than half a mile away, but it could be 50 miles. In the 1750s the sea wasn't a view that they liked at all. It was still something to be avoided something to be afraid of. Not anymore. We've learned to love the wildness of the seaside, haven't we? 
We've learned to put up with the sand in the Marmite sandwiches of life, to tolerate the sudden squalls of snow in June and the intense body shriveling cold of the sea itself. And we have learnt that at almost any time of the year you can have a really nice time at the seaside. <laughs>